the front line is combat at its most brutal. It drives people to extreme acts for many complex reasons. They were fighting for each other, not for patriotism, but for their buddies. We reveal the most decisive front lines in the Second World War and take you deep into the heart of battle with the men who were there. They were attacking with divisions, and I had one rifle company with about 100 men. I was down to my last box of ammunition. We had no food, and we were hurt. Iwo Jima, 1945, a tiny island in the Pacific, and the biggest Marine Corps battle ever. When we landed on the beach, it was absolute chaos. But the war's most iconic image overshadows combat in its most intense form. I strapped on a flamethrower and went to work. And the horrendous losses compel the Americans to relearn the art of war as the brilliant Japanese commander outmaneuvers his enemy. General Kurabayashi figured out that defending the beach was actually a critical mistake. Iwo Jima's brutal, relentless front line stands as an enduring symbol of sacrifice and courage. That's why I lost the best friend I've ever had in my life. Eyewitnesses called it a nightmare in hell. When the brutal fight for Iwo Jima begins in February 1945, a quarter of all the US Marines killed in the Second World War will die on this speck of land in the Pacific. It's a shock to the system for Americans, the unrelenting level of casualties They only understand over time that Iwo Jima itself is also the enemy. In Japanese, it means sulfur island. Pear-shaped, it's 8,000 meters long and covers 20 square kilometers, dominated by the dormant volcano Mount Suribachi. So why does Iwo Jima become the graveyard for more than 24,000 men? By late 1944, the Japanese are in retreat. Their once proud fleet is virtually destroyed in history's largest naval battle at Leyte Gulf in October. With the Allies now in total control of the air and oceans, General MacArthur returns to liberate the Philippines, while the US Marines have paid a terrible price storming tiny islands such as Saipan and Guam. Iwo Jima is their next step towards Japan. But above and below ground, it has been turned into a stronghold where the front line will witness new levels of carnage. The Marines have to attack the Japanese defenders head on. They have no choice. Because Iwo Jima is an island, they can't sneak around the back, they can't come in from the side. They have to attack from the front over and over and over again. And that leads to mass slaughter on both sides. But they forgot to tell the Marines tasked with this seemingly impossible mission, what lies ahead. So nobody could imagine that it was going to take that long to take uh, 36 days to take that little piece of rock. And we didn't have any intelligence about the rock at all. By February 1945, they're confident that about 70,000 Marines will overwhelm around 21,000 defenders. Iwo Jima sits mid-ocean between the Mariana Islands and Japan. The US Pacific strategy now depends on huge B-29 bombers from the Marianas flying an extraordinary 2,600 kilometers 
to cripple Japan's war economy. But Iwo Jima can warn the defenses, increasing American casualties. So we were losing B-29s and seven highly skilled Americans. We couldn't protect them, and we had no way of rescuing them. So they told me that's why we had to, had to take Iwo Jima. By early 1945, Iwo Jima is strategically crucial to the Americans because an airstrip at Iwo Jima could serve as a useful emergency landing strip for those B-29s. Potentially saving many American lives. But various U.S. delays play into the hands of the Japanese. From May 1944, Lieutenant General Tadamishi Kuribayashi transforms the defenses using miners and engineers as well as hundreds of artillery pieces. His strategy is to inflict as many casualties as he can and sap America's will to fight on. Life on Iwo Jima wasn't bad in the beginning. We had control of the air and sea, so it was a pleasant, peaceful place. Iwo Jima is actually considered part of the Japanese home territory. And because of that, it's very strategically and psychologically important to the Japanese. They vow to fight until the last man is dead. We must kill 10 of the enemy before giving up our own lives. The key thing to remember about General Kurabayashi is that he had a chance to study the tactics that had worked, study the defensive tactics that hadn't worked, and he fed all of that into his defense of Iwo Jima. The Americans are equally determined to avoid the previous horrendous casualty tolls with careful planning and months of softening up. From August 1944, massive Air Force bombing raids start. Enhanced in December by shelling from US Navy cruisers. By the end of January 1945, Iwo Jima has been hit by 72 days of sustained airstrikes to prepare the ground for a mass amphibious assault by two divisions of Marines. When we boarded the ship, they uh, brought out a board that had a diagram on it that uh, outlined the, the looks of Iwo Jima. And that's where we first learned where we were going and the name of it. The big gun battleships and carrier aircraft start a targeted bombardment of the beach defenses. The Marines demand 10 days, but the Navy only agrees to three causing huge resentment that only deepens as poor weather severely hinders accuracy. I could not forget the sight of dead Marines who had died assaulting defenses which should have been taken out by naval gunfire. The bombardment seems devastating, but the Navy refuses to accept they are essentially firing blind. You need a forward observer who can see the target, who can correct the fire or the bombing to have real effect. The kind of blind firing and blind bombing that they were doing before the troops landed doesn't really work all that effectively. Waves of carrier airstrikes increase the intensity as the big warships close in. Protected underground, the defenders are extremely well motivated, but sometimes poorly equipped. Ensign Omagari commands 60 men, but only has 20 rifles and two small mortars. I pondered how I would meet my end. Iwo Jima will be our tomb. Rather than their dull, regular rations, the Marines are fed steak and eggs, a treat only served on the eve of battle. The Americans believed that the main danger point was the moment that the troops came ashore at the beach 
And so they worked all of their tactics and strategy to try and make that moment as overwhelmingly in their favor as possible. If you are a Marine waiting to attack the shores of Iwo Jima, it just gives you a bit of a morale boost to see that the Navy is doing its bit and you see huge explosions on the island. The 5th Marine Division will land on the left by Mount Suribachi and 4th Division on the right, confronting the 1st Airfield and Quarry Cliffs. The Navy unleashes the heaviest shore bombardment of the whole Pacific War. Waves of landing craft set off as squadrons of carrier strike aircraft hit the beach and Mount Suribachi's defences. The first waves of Marines travel in protected Amtraks, spearheaded by armoured assault guns. The Marines are met with sporadic fire and an open expanse of black volcanic ash. that quickly bogs down both man and machine. There are so many of them. I saw their numbers swell from several hundred to a few thousand. But the bombardment has worked. The Japanese fire falls away. However, the advance units still struggle to get just 300 meters inland as the landing zone becomes congested. Then, the air and ground erupt. The Japanese spring their trap. Their carefully hidden batteries create a bloodbath. A vast array of artillery and huge mortars lob massive shells into the tightly packed marines, causing carnage. We were under a tremendous artillery barrage. I had a piece of shrapnel about the size of a small refrigerator that landed along the side of my shell hole. The beaches were so full of men, boats and vehicles that there was no way to miss them. Military combat is often about learning what your opponent does. What he had figured out was that defending the beach was actually a critical mistake. General Kuribayashi's troops remain concealed but his gun batteries decimate the thousands of men now caught on the open beach. As the Japanese defenders on Iwo Jima fire on the Marines, American warships and circling planes quickly target them. They pulverize one gun emplacement a few survivors escape to the fury of their officer. How dare you desert your post in the face of the enemy? The Supreme Commander has forbidden retreat. All hands would defend their post to the death. Their only alternative is execution. The beach fills with casualties and those about to become casualties, usually with a devastating blast wound. An injury either from explosive laid in the territory or very high velocity, very large caliber weapons being fired at them. It's also an environment that is particularly problematic for disease. And wherever you have that, you have particular problems for infection. The medics are forced to make brutal decisions. 
Triage on Iwo Jima, like everything else in the medical sphere, is really concentrated down to a very fine and really very difficult point. Life or death, strong enough to live or have to be left to die. About one in three of the Marines become casualties. On the left flank, armored vehicles support the 28th Regiment's attack on Suribachi. Its layers of mines and bunkers are held by an enemy determined to fight for every rock. We were charging downhill into fortified pillboxes and bunkers that stretched all the way across the base of Suribachi. The only cover we had was shell holes and bomb craters. On the right flank, one battalion assaults the quarry's heavily defended cliffs. 750 of the 900 men are killed or wounded that day. Iwo Jima is a very tough experience for the US Marine. Progress is extremely slow on the American side, sometimes a few meters a day. It's always uh, a fight to the death because these soldiers do not surrender. In many ways, the Marines are fighting Iwo Jima itself as much as the Japanese. Thanks to the tactics of General Kuribayashi. His innovative plan combines three elements. Forbidding Banzai suicide charges that expose his troops to the immense US firepower. Holding every position to the death while never surrendering. And completely exploiting the terrain. By the time the Americans invaded, the Japanese had built an interlocking network of defensive fortifications that could bring firepower just about anywhere on the island that protected the Japanese soldiers and that enabled them to move around without detection by the Americans. The Japanese have fortified the island, exploiting its natural features to the full. Caves, tunnels, ravines, and ridges. 1,500 hidden pillboxes are armed with hundreds of heavy guns and mortars, buried deep inside concrete bunkers, blockhouses, or reinforced caves. 18 kilometers of tunnels link subterranean command posts, ammunition dumps, and living spaces. These impregnable positions defy the American firepower and prowess of the Marines, who fall far short of their objectives on day one. Reaching just the fringes of Mount Suribachi, the first airfield's perimeter, and the cliffs by the quarry. After just 18 hours, US casualties surpass 2,300. I don't know who he is, but the Japanese general running this show is one smart bastard. The relentless Japanese shelling continues overnight, and the frontline reporters witness the dawn carnage. It's like a nightmare in hell. They died with the greatest possible violence. Nowhere in the Pacific have I seen such badly mangled bodies. Many were cut squarely in half. Legs and arms lay 50 feet away from any body. In six hours of heavy fighting, the Marines advanced just 70 meters towards Suribachi. It was an awful sight to burn them alive. We could hear the screams. On a daily basis, I saw the after effects, which were grisly. Each man should think of his defense position as his graveyard. Fight until the last and inflict much damage to the enemy. The fighting on Iwo Jima quickly descends to new levels of barbarity. No quarter is asked or given. One of our comrades was captured by the Japanese 
and pulled into a cave where they tortured him by splitting his finger webs up to his wrists. He was screaming uncontrollably. The Japanese always fight to the last man. But beyond the appalling conditions, the cruel behavior of the combatants on both sides is partly fueled by racial hatred. The savage fighting in Iwo Jima in part is a consequence of two racial groups who have both encouraged their troops to think of the enemy as not being human, so that they're much more willing to commit atrocities. The racist approach of dehumanizing the enemy applies to both sides on the conflict. So the Japanese do it to the Americans, and the Americans do it back to the Japanese. And we can see it very clearly here from this poster, where there's the phrase, death trap for the Jap. And it's a way of encouraging soldiers to be particularly brutal in battle. So you can see in this poster here that the Japanese has got craw-like hands which are soaked in blood. He, he's depicted as evil, aggressive, not a human being. So this is direct, brutal, racist propaganda used to inspire American troops. This kind of racial animosity on both sides, the Americans seeing the Japanese as inferior and the Japanese seeing the Americans as weak, really fed into the fighting on Iwo Jima. Both sides were dehumanizing the other side, using a lot of really nasty and barbaric techniques. And then the Japanese hit the Americans with another truly shocking tactic. Offshore, the veteran fleet carrier USS Saratoga suddenly detects waves of aircraft on its radar and scrambles fighters to join its circling interceptor force. But they are overwhelmed by these Japanese fanatics. 50 Divine Wind kamikaze pilots whose planes are their bombs. These are not the first such suicidal attacks. They had started five months earlier. The few that survive the wall of anti-aircraft fire smash into the Saratoga and sink a smaller carrier, killing over 350 American sailors. This front line no longer has any rules. Evidence suggests some kamikaze pilots are high on crystal meth. But their extraordinary attacks are motivated by something deeper. Almost 6,000 young men were involved in kamikaze attacks. And you have to ask the question, why would a 20-year-old, some even as young as 17, sacrifice their life at this early point? They were enshrined in this belief of Bushido, of loyalty to the nation, loyalty to the emperor, absolute sacrifice for a higher cause, and persuaded to do it for their families and the good of the country. Ritual is very important in persuading young men to depart on a suicide mission. And one of the things they would wear would be a samurai headband, which indicates that they are willing to die for the cause. It was a way of reinforcing in the pilot's mind that he really had to do this. This was his fundamental duty to the nation and the emperor. The defenders of Mount Suribachi follow the same code. Virtually none surrender. After four days on the island, the Marines have suffered over 4,500 casualties. E Company, 2nd Battalion, 28th Marines, finally storm the rim of Suribachi's crater. They raise a small flag on a piece of pipe, as recorded by Marine photographer Sergeant Louis Lowry. But this is not the iconic picture that fills the world's front pages. That is taken spontaneously by AP's Joe Rosenthal, when a much bigger flag is brought up. Then everything broke loose down below. The troops started cheering, 
Ships blew their whistles and horns. It's something you don't forget. It really seemed to summarize a moment of triumph when these tired, these exhausted, these wounded Americans had overcome Japanese resistance and had managed to raise old glory over the most dominating feature in Iwo Jima. It summarized a moment of triumph for Americans. Watching on the beach, the head of the US Navy understands the significance of the moment. The raising of that flag on Suribachi means a Marine Corps for the next 500 years. The Marines may have raised their flag, but we still held most of the island. The island is now split in two. But the reserve 3rd Marine Division has had to land to compensate for the appalling losses to the 4th and 5th Divisions. In the centre, Corporal Herschel Woody Williams leads his unit's attack to take the second airfield. We became the spearhead of the group. Going across the airfield, we lost a tremendous number of, of Marines because there's no protection. Tanks try to clear a path, but are blocked by devastating fire from rows of bunkers. There were reinforced concrete pillboxes. A bomb hitting it wouldn't destroy it. Uh, artillery hitting the front of it wouldn't do it. Bazookas wouldn't do it because it was so thick. Corporal Williams, his commanding officer, asks if he will try to burn out the bunkers. My response was, I'll try, but he gave me four Marines. Their job was to whatever pillbox I selected that I was going to try to burn out, they were to fire at that pillbox to keep them from being able to fire at me. So I strapped on a flamethrower and went to work. During the course of uh, four hours, most of it is absolute, no memory. I don't know why. I eliminated or burned out seven of those. The cumbersome rig makes him an easy target. The heavy tanks can project flames effectively up to 20 meters, but only for eight seconds. And Corporal Williams has to use six separate flamethrowers. By getting rid of seven of those pillboxes, that gave us an opening so that we could get through, right through their line. I sealed a lot of caves, and I blew up a few pillboxes. Uh, but I never used a flamethrower again. His actions that day win him America's highest military award, the Medal of Honor. After six days, the Marines now battle for the main runway on the second airfield. The cost now exceeds 1,000 American lives, with more than 3,700 wounded. As a result of the savage combat, it's virtually impossible to estimate Japanese casualties at key moments. Any records that were kept have been lost. Major General Erskine, the commander of the 3rd Division, comes ashore on the 24th of February. Private Don Mates is part of his bodyguard detail. When we landed on the beach, it was just absolute chaos. They hadn't yet started to bury any of the bodies. They were bloated, there were maggots, there were parts of bodies, there were Marines that were, had no head, missing legs. Private Mates guards the general on his way to the front line, right in the center of the island. Their advance is blocked by more high ground, rising to 116 meters. The third and fourth divisions combine in the assault. 
but the few men that reach the summit are quickly surrounded by the Japanese. Only a hasty barrage of smoke allows the Marines to withdraw. An advance of less than 100 meters that day has cost 500 more casualties. The area now earns its nickname, the Meat Grinder. Men didn't just die on the Yojima, they were ripped apart, torn to shred and scattered. I saw torsos with no limbs, dismembered legs, arms and hands, and internal organs splashed on the rocks. The Japanese used the high ground to shell the Marines with a particularly devastating weapon, the ghost rocket, or 320 millimeter spigot mortar. A spigot mortar is bigger than a 55 gallon oil drum. It's just loaded with explosives. It's a rocket propelled and it tumbles. It blew a tremendous hole in the ground. You'd, you'd bleed from the ears, you'd bleed from the nose. The huge screaming missile rounds hit them day and night. So General Erskine calls for eight volunteers. And we set out on February 28th to look for these uh, spigot mortars and see where they were coming from. Climbing to the ridgeline between two hills that is still held by the Japanese. It overlooked an open mine sulfur pit. And when a uh, shell would come and land in the sulfur pit, it would ignite the sulfur. But what came out of the sulfur fumes were the Japanese who were coming at us. We knew we were in big trouble. The battle lasted about three hours. And thank God we had grenades the way we did. I read he was bayoneted. McCluskey, they never found his body. Netzel, he died of wounds received. Garrett, for some reason, the Japanese bayoneted him and they took his rifle and left their rifle. Just something symbolic. Trimble and I did the best we could to hold them off. There was no talking, there was just screaming. But one sound would always stand out. The Japanese arm their grenades by hitting them together. I didn't hear the click, but Trimble did. And he hollered grenades, and I blew away the Japanese who got within a couple feet of me. Grenades came flying in and peppered Jimmy's back. It broke both of my legs. When I looked down, I, my crotch was just a bloody mess. As well as the blast injury, the shrapnel cuts him apart. Blanchard picked me up, carried me back. White put on uh, tourniquets. He took my, my belt, took his belt, and did both my legs with my bandage and his bandages. But his buddy, Jimmy Trimble, is killed. We know that Don must have been pretty badly injured because the field medic from his unit, who's looking to control the bleed, applies not only a field dressing and a bandage as a tourniquet, but also a belt. Belts are ideal. They've got a buckle, which means you can tighten them as far as they'll go, and then they'll hold there. There must have been enough exposed flesh on his wound for the field medic to be really worried about infection, so he sprinkles sulfur over the open soft tissue damage. Sulfur powder is a very basic antibiotic used to stop the spread of bacterial infection. A corpsman came along and uh, gave me a, a shot of morphine. That morphine just spreads a warm feeling over you and you just completely relax and the pain goes away. It's just marvelous. He's evacuated, but all the hospital ships are full. So Private Mate's operation is on a troop ship in the kitchen. 
and where he was given the cutting edge of infection control. This is penicillin, and this is in tablet form. And we also know that that's where things started to go wrong. That's where I got a, uh, a shot of penicillin. And it turned out that I'm allergic to penicillin because I went into a coma for 10 or 11 days and your blood pressure drops down to nothing and your skin just peels right off. The people who invented and developed penicillin had a sense that the allergic reaction was going to be a problem. They didn't, at this stage, know exactly how much, but people like Don bring it home to them that nothing is a straightforward win. Whatever progress we make is often checked, and we have to be brave enough to understand that this may happen. Don, unfortunately, was at the sharp end of that. He has flown home for a long convalescence. They can't use penicillin, they're back to sulfur drugs. And this is a long and difficult process to manage his wounds and his general health for the rest of his life. Only in 1982 does Don Mates undergo his last operation to remove bits of Iwo Jima from his body. Whatever is thrown at them, the defenders fight on, even when cut off, without food, water, or ammunition. Ensign Omagari hides himself amongst the bodies and then tries to blow up a US tank as it passes by. The dead were no longer seen as human beings, but as objects. Even the dead were called to fight. Ensign Omagari and his men remain loyal to their military code inspired by their unwavering commander. So here we have a letter from General Kiribayashi, who's the commander-in-chief on Iwo Jima, and he's writing to his daughter, Takako. So here in the letter, he's describing the dream that he's had about how they will be reunited at some point in the future. But he knows he's gone to war. He knows he's not gonna survive this battle. He won't see his family again. And this is him, he's a cultured man, expressing how he feels and trying to understand the position he's in. So these letters are an enormously important source of how Japanese soldiers were thinking and feeling. It's the major way we know about how they suffered and how they coped with the intense stress of these battles. The Japanese defenders on Iwo Jima are motivated by the Bushido culture, the idea that you can't surrender, you must fight to the death, you can't let the emperor down. Official Japanese military ethics described surrender as one of the most shameful things you could possibly do. The constant combat 24-7, sometimes with 50% unit casualties or worse, begin to sap even the Marines' renowned fighting spirit. When you get to a stage where you're completely exhausted um, because you live in constant fear, you haven't slept because you haven't really eaten, and this is where drill kicks in. Comradeship, for a better word, quite often does play a role, so that you are actually fighting and keep going, not only for you, but for the people to the left and right of you. Rotations off the front line, plus the regular supply of food, ammunition and reinforcements, keep the Marines in the fight. Bolstered by the supporting firepower, volleys of rockets mounted on trucks become more effective as they are now targeted by forward observers. The Americans have to figure out ways to get the Japanese up out of these buried fortifications um, without risking their own lives. And so they were willing to use just about any tactics to do that, whether it be flamethrowers, white phosphorus incendiary devices, satchels of TNT that they threw down into the bunkers, and killing them meant using a lot of really nasty and barbaric techniques. These slowly begin to blow, blast, and burn the Japanese inside their bunkers, caves, and tunnels. Many are just sealed inside and left to die. Other caves are found filled with the wounded who have committed suicide. 
flamethrower tanks increase the napalm inferno. A few Japanese who seem to surrender often detonate hidden grenades in an attempt to kill their captors. Night holds a particular terror, as Japanese attacks often end in brutal knife and grenade fights at close quarters. Slowly, the Marines push further east, taking heavy casualties for every piece of land. After more than two weeks of slaughter, the Japanese hold out along the northern and eastern sections of the island. Our strong points might be able to fight delaying actions for several more days. I comfort myself a little, seeing my officers and men die without regret after struggling in this inch-by-inch inch battle against an overwhelming enemy. But General Kuribayashi is being premature. Somehow, his beleaguered forces will hold out for another three weeks. A crippled B-29 Superfortress approaches Iwo Jima and is able to land even under fire. After 14 days of nothing but conflict and casualties, the Americans finally have something to cheer about. Dynamite is quickly repaired on the new US airfield in the shadow of Suribachi. The Marines now enter a lunar landscape of hills, valleys, ravines and canyons which tanks can't penetrate. Every mound hides a defensive position, while any movement attracts fire. Corporal Woody Williams is one of the few original Marines still left in the fight. We were the first group to reach the northern shore of the island. That was five miles from where we started. When we uh, hit the beach, we had uh, about 278 people in C Company. That was the company I was in. And on March the uh, 5th, we were down to 17. But we got some replacements, and the next morning we were ordered into to the attacks. Peace Shrapnel caught up with me, and uh, the corpsman came and practically cut my dungarees off and uh, took the shrapnel out of me, put some sulfur dr drugs on me, put a pressure bandage around my leg, and then put a tag on me. When he tags you and tells you that you must go back, you gotta go back, but, but those were the instructions. It's really critical that we have some sense of who the patient is. So this is another really well thought through, well designed piece of kit, and we haven't done much better than this today. It's the Book of Emergency Medical Tags, and it's effectively the medical record of every single casualty. You fill it in, you tear one away, and it contains details, really important details, like the name of the casualty, where they were wounded, and most importantly of all, the time that they were wounded. The idea is that the patient will be got back to somewhere like the hospital ship, and they'll probably need surgery. And before you can give them the right amount of anesthetic, or indeed any more morphine, we need to know what chemicals he's already got in his bloodstream. And most importantly of all, a little bit of string that ties the tag to the button of whatever bit of the uniform is left, so that properly stays with the casualty. He tagged me and uh, told me, now you've got to go back. And because of the new Marines and so few of us still left that knew what the heck we were doing, I said, I'm not going to go. So I reached up and pulled the tag off, and I said, I'm not going to go. I don't have a tag on me. But in just a short time after that, uh, my assistant came running by me and a mortar caught him, smacked that in the center of the head and killed him instantly. That's where I lost the best friend I've ever had in my life. We were much closer than I was to any of my brothers because our lives depended on each other, and we knew that. The two had made a solemn pact to return the other's favorite signet ring to their families if either fell. He was stretched out on the ground and there was that ring. And it's a court-martial offense to take anything off of a dead Marine. They tell you that very stringently, very forcefully. But 
I made that pact with him, and if it court-martialed me, it court-martialed me, so I finally got the ring off. Corporal Williams kept his word and returned the ring to his fallen comrade's family in America. His 3rd Division finally breaks out to the furthest coast, pinching out a Japanese salient. The defenders only hold out in pockets to the Far East and Northern Tip, which now earns its nickname, Death Valley. With American casualties now exceeding 11,000, anger grows on the home front at the appalling scale of the losses. The American public wasn't really used to getting reports of massive casualties. The government actually starts to get very worried that American home front morale is gonna crumble under the pressure. They declare victory at home. It's a lie, but it's a lie that's designed to make Americans feel better about what's happening. Iwo Jima is declared secure on the 14th of March. If this damn place has been secured, where the hell is all this gunfire coming from? Public opinion is extremely important to support armed forces when they're in combat. And even though there was some censorship uh, of the news media during the time, there was also quite a few headlines about just how difficult the fighting on Iwo Jima was, with headlines talking about casualties reaching 6,000 individuals. Next page here, taken a couple of days later, where gaining 400 yards during the battle was seen as worthy of a headline. And moving to our last one, they start to actually question whether the price is worth paying. The armed forces need to have the support of the public. They're the ones who are sending their sons, brothers and husbands overseas to fight. And if public support drops for a war, then your country's in trouble. Further proof of the racial undertones is even evident on the front pages. And here we have an example of a headline. Yank planes using Iwo, second NIP airfield near capture. Needless to say, not the sort of language that we would use to denote the enemy these days. The main resistance is now focused on General Kuribayashi's bunker headquarters in Death Valley. The enemy's bombardments were very severe, so fierce that I cannot express or write it here. It takes the Marines 10 days to clear them out, at the cost of over 1,700 more casualties. The intensity of the sustained combat on Iwo Jima is in part demonstrated by the number of medals awarded. America's highest military decoration is the Medal of Honor. Marines win 22 of the 27 awarded on Iwo Jima, the most in any single battle. Two of the things that motivate soldiers are promotion and medals. This is a bronze star awarded for meritorious or heroic conduct by members of the American Armed Services. To receive a bravery award in any armed forces is a sign of courage and achievement, particularly with your peer group. And that is a big motivator. My life completely changed the day that uh, I received the Medal of Honor. It probably was the best thing that happened to me. I was forced to talk about what happened and those moments of, of emotion and those moments of uh, memories that you can't forget. And I think it was a therapy for me. After 36 days of slaughter, the capture and occupation phase ends. Iwo Jima is deemed to be conquered. No one knows how General Kuribayashi died, and his men fight a guerrilla war for months before a few hundred surrender in small groups. 
In 1968, America hands sovereignty of Iwo Jima back to Japan. Nearly 6,000 Marines were killed and over 17,000 wounded, along with more than 880 American Navy fatalities. It's estimated Japan loses around 18 to 20,000 men. A terrible price paid to win a refuge for damaged B-29 bombers. But over 2,250 will make emergency landings on Iwo Jima. However, many now argue a lot of them would have limped home anyway. Given the level of casualties that the US took to take Iwo Jima, it's hard to see how there could have been enough B-29s and their crew saved from the emergency airstrip to balance that out. I have a hard time saying that this was completely without meaning or that they shouldn't have done it in retrospect because no matter what happened, no matter which islands they invaded, it was gonna be a horrific bloodbath. Iwo Jima is the clearest warning yet of the horrors that lie ahead for a full-scale invasion of Japan. With an estimated body count of well over two million casualties. Instead, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August 1945 brings the war to a shocking close. <laughs>